great to be here. Um, so I'm uh, Johannes. I work in the blockchain team at, at BMW. So BMW does have a blockchain team, which I guess is a good first sign. Um, what we do um, in the blockchain team, I'm going to talk about that a little bit. What I'm also going to talk about is uh, what happens if you do blockchain and data science at the same time. So um, interesting well, organizational fact, um, our blockchain team at uh, BMW is actually co-located um, with uh, teams that work on data platforms, that work on AI. So it's kind of all under the same department. Um, now, this might be coincidence, right? Maybe our management thought, well, let's put all these technologies that are kind of buzzwordy into the same department. But uh, I like to think that they had uh, the vision in mind that there is a lot of potential when it comes to actually combining blockchain and data. And uh, so this, was, this will be the focus of today's talk. I will somehow start by talking a little bit about uh, the BMW IT. So we are 4,500 employees, or actually more than that. Uh, now, um, we work in over 60 different countries and um, manage quite a few software projects. But what I'm trying to get to is actually the BMW blockchain network. So the good news is that pretty much everywhere where we do IT, we also do blockchain. And the way IT works within BMW is that we've got uh, the big headquarter in Munich with about 3,500 3, employees. And then we also have all these tech offices all around the world. And they tend to like drive innovation, quick innovation. And this is what happened with blockchain technology as well. So a couple of years back, it was actually tech offices, I think, mostly in Singapore and here in the States that came up with first proof of technologies for um, blockchain projects and uh, were quite successful with them back in the days, which, uh, which then led um, to BMW actually uh, founding an entire dedicated team uh, for blockchain technology. Okay, um, so what I will do today is um, everything that I do, I will try to map on a AI technology, namely autonomous driving. So I'm not the biggest expert when it comes to autonomous driving. I'm more of a blockchain data science guy, but nevertheless, it's a technology that kind of fits nicely to um, well, showcase what the opportunities are when it comes to uh, combining uh, blockchain and data. So my go-to example will be autonomous driving. And um, well, as you probably all know, um, the goal of autonomous driving is to kind of get rid of the driver, right? So this is what you see in the, in the lowest picture here on the right. You don't really have a steering wheel anymore. You don't have like the pedals. Um, so that comes up, uh, that brings new uh, problems. Um, for example, like who will perform all these tasks that you would need like a human for? Um, so this picture here, for those who haven't been to Germany yet, this is how a parking um, station sign looks like. Uh, so this is meant to be parking, but also like charging, tolling, whatever payments you made out of the vehicle, who's gonna do that, right? And I know that uh, colleagues from Daimler Mobility Services are here today gonna talk about a vehicle wallet, which I guess is one of the most fundamental things to, to take care of these tasks. What I want to do, is uh, to talk about um, basically all other technologies that are needed, right? So this is one of my favorite slides, as it kind of um, well, puts into one slide all the buzzwords that are out there that you kind of need to, to be able to talk uh, mobility and, um, and blockchain nowadays. So first one being, this is what Bashkar also, also called ABC earlier, right? Like IoT devices, so everything is able to communicate. You've got AI where one fun fact as well is Gartner predicts that by 2020, so next year, 30% of all software um, development projects will have AI components, which means that both data scientists and software engineers are gonna collaborate to uh, push these projects further. And um, lastly, a blockchain, right? Which is, I guess, the reason why all of us are here today and um, which is kind of the trust anchor in all these communications. So on the side, Gartner, again, who uh, well, they say that the confluence of blockchain, IoT, and AI enables every entity, some person, machine, thing, to have an identity, be intelligent, and uh, transact with other entities. So I, I think that, well, summarizes it quite nicely. 
So let me talk a little bit about what um, we do at BMW when it comes to blockchain technology. So as mentioned, right, all the tech offices came up with quite a long list of uh, use cases and we bucketed them in three areas. So we focus on uh, supply chain, vehicle, and well, other technologies like autonomous driving. And uh, interestingly enough, these buckets kind of mirror the working groups of Mobi, right? So I know that Mobi has a working group when it comes to supply chain. All the EVGI, uh, vehicle ID, uh, UBI working groups kind of fit nicely into the bucket of vehicle customer. And then there is also a working group that uh, focuses on uh, marketplaces for autonomous driving connected vehicles, right? Which would kind of be the last of these uh, buckets. Um, and we have this very nice video that I want to show you now uh, that kind of summarizes uh, what BMW does when it comes to blockchain technology. So I hope this will work. Great. Blockchain, what's behind the technology and what do we need it for? Let me give you a practical example. The service manual containing all information about a vehicle, repairs, services, mileage, etc. The blockchain technology allows us to equip each vehicle with a digital car pass. Think of it as a digital ledger, where all information about the vehicle is written into. A digital fingerprint of this ledger is stored safely encrypted by every participant of the blockchain network. The vehicle sends fingerprints of any updated information about maintenance, inspections, etc. to all participants of the network, where they are verified by comparing them to the previous version of the fingerprint. Then the verified fingerprint is stored again by every participant on the blockchain. If somebody tries to manipulate any data now, for example by changing the mileage of a used car, it will not match with the information stored in the blockchain anymore, so the fraud attempt will be recognized in the next report. Thus, the blockchain technology grants reliable information about the vehicle's history. The car owner can then share this information with many kinds of stakeholders. For example, insurance companies, workshops, distributors, or someone interested in buying a used car. The buyer of a used car, in turn, can check for the correctness of all vehicle data at the reseller via a dedicated app. There are many more conceivable applications for the blockchain technology. For example, it can help to trace raw materials throughout the whole supply chain all the way to its source in order to ensure ethical and sustainable extraction. Likewise, the blockchain can simplify the charging of electric vehicles, for example by permitting the car owners to charge at stations of various suppliers. Or the blockchain can enable autonomous vehicles to take care of all interactions and transactions by themselves, for example charging, paying a toll, or a parking fee. And this is just a small glimpse of the enormous blockchain technology potentials. Find more in the article on BMW.com. So as mentioned, uh, if you want to find out more, go to BMW.com, because uh, this is where I will stop talking about blockchain use kit that are currently being developed at uh, BMW. What I want to focus on instead is, uh, well, the confluence of uh, blockchain and data, as I called it, right? So I, I worked, um, before working on blockchain, um, I worked on data platforms at BMW, right? And I think uh, many industries uh, for the last decade have kind of tried to well, break down data silos within the company, right? To kind of pool and centralize data assets in one, what we call data lake, right? Um, and this is due to well, obvious reasons, right? That you have um, huge opportunities when it when when it comes to advanced analytics use cases that employ different sources of data. Um, one of the my favorite examples is predictive maintenance, right? Where you want to predict outages of machines or like um, required maintenance of machines, and you would need like data from production, from engineering, from after sales. And in order to do proper analytics cases, you want to kind of pool all these data assets in one place. Um, and now, basically, what, what ended up happening, and this is actually one of the projects that I was involved in, turns out that the machines that we have at BMW are so good, right, they, they tend to not fail often enough in order to do proper analytics, right? Um, now, the good, the good thing is, basically, this is a pretty standardized machine, so it's not only BMW that employs it, but maybe also other car manufacturers or other suppliers. 
And um, pooling all these outages together might actually help when it comes to doing proper like prediction, proper machine learning cases. But uh, well, surprisingly enough, if we talk to our colleagues from Daimler, I don't know, I haven't asked them yet, but they were probably not just like hand over the data. So how can you kind of make sure to, to do proper machine learning models on uh, data sets that you don't own, right? This is like one of the key questions. And um, this is why the, central, like, the centralized picture of our BMW data lake is not really, well, um, a good representation of how the ecosystem looks nowadays because you want to kind of, um, can't really see it, but you want to extend it by including, for example, data sets that come out of the supply chain network or maybe also out of the mobility network to do uh, proper analytics cases on top. So this is what I'm going to talk about um, in the next uh, minutes. And again, using the example of autonomous driving, right? So um, I think two key issues that arise when it comes to autonomous driving are uh, represented here. So two bright men said first that the critical path to introduce autonomous driving will, kill it, will not be the technology, but uh, the development of a metric that empowers approval. Right? And uh, the second thing that I want to focus on is a citation that says the biggest obstacle to using AI or advanced analytics isn't skill base. Um, it's really plain old access to data. Right? And um, so let me see how uh, blockchain can maybe help uh, solving these issues. So autonomous driving. Um, I, I think probably most of you will know that there are different levels when it comes to autonomous driving, right? We tend to talk from level zero to level five, where on level zero, you basically don't have any assistance, right? You, you have to do everything by yourself. And level five will be um, the stage where, well, you don't need driver anymore. You pretty much can, well, sleep or, or, or even like, I don't know, don't look on the street anymore or do anything. And basically, as the technology matures, uh, more and more of the responsibility is kind of taken over from the um, human, right, to the machine. Especially if you go from level two to level three, right, where at some point you can take your hands off the wheel and uh, your eyes off the road, there's a lot of trust required when it comes to um, trusting the machine that does the uh, decision making for you. And uh, now, everybody that did machine learning at some point in their life or has to do with data knows that, well, AI does do mistakes from time to time, right? And um, there's this interesting article that said that you only need three small stickers on an intersection to kind of misguide your autonomous um, assistant in a competitor of ours. Um, and now I don't think blockchain can really solve that, right? Let's be honest. Uh, it's, a, it's a cool technology, but it's not that good. Uh, what blockchain might be able to do, though, is to kind of uh, make sure that you have a trusted uh, deployment of algorithm. And uh, let me go into what I mean by that. So one of the things that you might be able to do, right? I think probably also many of you know the W3C standard, right? We go to quick details what, uh, what this means. Basically, you have an issue, right? Let's go to the example of our use case. Um, I, as a auto manufacturer, I want to issue a claim about an algorithm that I published, right? It might have, well, the algorithm version might have a training data set uh, attributes, maybe a test score or whatever. Um, and that uh, claim, I give it to a vehicle that is now the holder of the claim, and that vehicle can now go to maybe, I don't know, uh, other vehicles or um, organizational institutions, regulations, um, to present that claim, right? And um, these institutions might be able to then verify that claim based on what grounds. Um, well, you have public and uh, key infrastructure that would allow you to make these um, assessments, that verifications. Um, so why do you need blockchain? Well, it turns out that this uh, public key infrastructure is pretty um, restrictive and maybe not dynamic enough. So this is why smart people from W3C came up with that standard that I think is very helpful. And uh, I'm going to go into details on how I think this might be able to help. All right, so going back to our autonomous driving um, example. 
you start with sensor data, and uh, you have all these steps until at some point you have that homologation process that will allow you to um, well, deploy an algorithm in a vehicle, right? That would then allow you to uh, well, drive that vehicle automatically. Yeah, um, this is obviously very simplistic, but um, at some point you start off with sensor data. You might need a vehicle wallet to sign that data. You normally have to include external data, right? For example, map data uh, as well. As long as these agents are not completely autonomous, um, you definitely require external data. You need data labels, right? Again, everybody that did machine learning before knows how critical data labeling is and that there are very diverse type of labels, right? So some of them might be, I don't know, automatically or machine-based labels, other um, high-quality labels, right? So you kind of need a reference to how the labeling was done in your machine learning algorithm. Um, you then have, sorry, you ha then have, well, the entire training stack, right? It really depends on what models you use and what maybe computational power you used, how many training iterations you did on the algorithm. Um, and at some point, right, as mentioned, you end up in the homologation scheme where you actually test um, your software version together with hardware versions, together with the external map data, and kind of make sure that everything makes sense. And this is obviously a very, very complex kind of process. And um, maybe this whole DID concept might uh, play a role here, where every step could get an identity. And what you're looking for in the end is a end-to-end -end data provenance, right? So for every algorithm that you put down the street, you can trace back the, um, well, training and the exist and then the, the basis for that algorithm back to the raw data. And uh, so what we believe is that at first, this is something that we will do internally for self-certification purposes, but at some point, I'm um, pretty sure that all these like governmental institutions out there will make that a requirement, right? So we have to basically have these certifications ready for um, regulatory uh, reasons. So kind of summarizing that a little bit, basically any AI applications work the same way. Uh, you start off with raw data. You then have data processing machine learning. You then have business decisions that you base on top of that. And many applications then have like these cross organizational tracks actions um, on top, right? So autonomous driving again, you, you start off with LiDAR data, I don't know, radar data, audio data, I don't know. You then have uh, algorithms that, that um, do predictions, sensor fusions, um, all these different things that are needed. The business decision would be, for example, do I accelerate, do I brake? And basically, uh, on top of that, you might have like a platooning use case where you want to transact and interact with other entities. And key um, thing is that you basically need trust all the way from the sensor to the um, actuator. And what current blockchains do is really, they only tackle that very top part, right? But what you would need is the trust entire, the entire thing. And uh, so you have a gap there. And I'm, I'm not saying that you would need like full-blown blockchain applications all the way from sensors to actuators. This would be probably pretty expensive and maybe not worthwhile, but certain blockchain capabilities might come into play um, and um, should come into play for us to be able to trust our algorithms in the end. Okay, let me look at the second uh, example. Um, so access to data, how can blockchain help there? I think this was already kind of... Um, put into perspective by uh, Bashk earlier in this, in this excellent uh, presentation. Uh, what I want to do is to kind of focus on similar things, so many things will sound familiar, but maybe coming from that corporate perspective a little bit more. So um, in autonomous driving, just to give you an idea of how important data is, right? So we, BMW currently has a fleet of prototypes driving around different cities and different regions in the world, and they collect uh, well, 1,500 terabytes of raw data every day. Um, yeah, some numbers listed just to give an impression, right? So there's a lot of computational power required. Um, it's pretty massive. And still, well, obviously, they are not really production ready yet, right? Um, so it seems like there, there is still a couple of things missing. And this might be due to the fact that if you look at the ecosystem of data, right, you have, well, all the OIMs that are doing their separate training, 
you have maybe research institutions um, like Udacity or Google, Vimo, Kitty, I don't know. Everybody has their own little pool of data. And what happens then is that this is normally a very good business case for a data broker, right? Who will try to combine these different data assets and make them uh, available to you as a combined version. But what you would really want is um, to have that kind of ecosystem not dominated by certain aggregators, right? This is the whole story about platform monopolies that we heard already today a couple of times. Um, so what the goal would be to be able to align incentives in such a way that all the actors in that ecosystem are incentivized to do something that I call, or people call, data co-creation when it comes to actually, well, I as BMW have an interest to, well, increase the quality of data, and by doing that, the entire ecosystem will benefit, right? If Daimler um, increases the quality of data, everybody will benefit. So everybody has got the same incentives in, in, in some way, right? So why not co-create? Um, so one of the questions that arises, okay, why do we need a decentralized marketplace, right? Like, I mean, you could have a central orchestration of that marketplace. Um, and this will somehow probably never work because of obvious reasons, right? I don't want to give away control of the data set that I own to a central organization. There's just a lack of trust, a lack of control, right? Um, normally, nobody really takes care of maintaining the data anymore. So again, if you're, if you're familiar with machine learning, uh, just like ingesting data into some data storage doesn't really do the trick, right? There's a lot of work involved when it comes to describing what the data does, making sure that the data quality is at a level where I can train my, my models without it failing all the time because they're like, I don't know. So there is a lot of maintenance involved. And um, as soon as you kind of push your data to that central aggregator, um, you don't really care anymore whether it's maintained, right? So you need some scheme of kind of incentivizing that maintenance. Um, so this is why decentralized data exchanges might make sense, right? The key being that everybody retains full control of uh, their data. Um, what you then have, and this is something that I think um, Bruce from Ocean Protocol will also talk about a little bit. Um, great company, by the way. We, we do a couple of projects with them uh, back in, in Munich and Berlin and uh, exciting stuff. Um, what you have as an opportunity then is to come up with these incentivization, incentivization schemes, right? Where you kind of incentivize people to um, make sure the data quality is there, right? Because basically, as soon as assets get tokenized, they have a different value, and uh, the, the value might depend on um, well demand um, more than in 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 the, in the way that it is now. So what are the technology enablers? Why do you need blockchain for that decentralized marketplace, right? Uh, first one being um, that you have, um, well, the obvious data and transaction lineage, right? Through basically re registering all these transactions on a blockchain. Um, well, you have the data availability and quality um, that I already mentioned due to like basically um, tokenizing your assets. You kind of have security and privacy by design, right? By the, simply by the fact that you can retain control of your data, but also there are so many interesting research uh, projects going on uh, currently when it comes to secure data enclaves, when it comes to private transactions that are off-chain, that are linked back to the network. There are a multitude of, of options currently that are being developed that kind of fulfill your exact requirement when it comes to security and data privacy. Um, yeah. And this brings me kind of to the end. I want to conclude by, by repeating a slide that we already had in uh, the Mobi Colloquium in February in Munich that we hosted. So again, shout out to the organizational teams. We've been there. We've organized one of these events together with Mobi in February, so we know how much work it is. Anyways, back then, uh, we showed the three elements for a successful blockchain project, right, um, which are development, but then you want to go out to consortia like Mobi, but also to technological consortia, right? And um, we've kind of added a fourth element, which we see is uh, more and more important 
especially when it comes to the scalability of such cases, which is uh, regulatory guidelines. So really think that successful implementation of a blockchain project at scale requires these uh, regulatory um, um, guidelines and um, especially when we talk GDPR, uh, when we talk Euron blockchain, um, there are so many things that you kind of need as enablers before being able to really um, scale the projects that we have currently. And I want to finish by briefly talking about the challenges that we see in 2020. Um, first one, focus. Uh, I think we've seen enough blockchain washing over the last years. You really, we really have to focus on cases where first many different um, entities uh, kind of benefit uh, together, right? Have aligned incentives and have a problem that they can solve only together. Um, second, I don't know whether you have a good blueprint on how to create ecosystems. It's it's a super difficult task. Um, I mean, we've seen it with Libra, who kind of seemed to work at first, but then apparently didn't really. I don't know. Um, it's it's it seems to be. I don't know. It seems to be very very difficult. And again, I hope that. Uh, events like today and, 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 and consortia like Mobi will kind of help um, guiding towards a good um, uh, well, opportunity to, to create these ecosystems. How do you onboard people? There are so many questions that have to be answered. Uh, third, regulation. I uh, just mentioned that, right? I think that this is a, a key issue, and right? especially when it comes to GDPR. And we're quite excited to see first movements in the market, right? Like just heard from the colleagues in China, apparently things are getting on their way. But also Germany came up with their blockchain strategy. So it seems like things are getting into movement. Um, I think Liechtenstein uh, is pretty... Uh, well, up there when it comes to um, setting these, these, these guidelines. So things are happening. And lastly, and uh, I don't know whether you've read the book by the Gartner people on the real value of blockchain, highly recommended, um, a great book. Uh, what they claim is that you kind of have to emerge from just redesigning um, well-known business um, um, processes. Right? What, what we want to get to really is to see what new business um, opportunities present themselves once you've enabled the, um, the ecosystems. And uh, lastly, and this is something that I try to pitch to my management back in Munich every day, is we kind of have to make that strategic decision, right? Do we really want to go into that democratic way of, 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 of setting up uh, business models, right? I mean, this is like a fundamental question that you kind of have to answer before uh, doing anything further. Uh, with that, Thank you for your attention and uh, looking forward to talking to you.